Okay. Um, so maybe I should um, put this up. We are recording now. Up. Okay, fantastic. I'm just putting up some uh, websites here. So maybe I should. We should introduce ourselves, perhaps, or don't. So um, my name is um, Vincent van Garven Uy. I am uh, one of the two co-directors of Punkton Books. And um, since last year, we made a pledge, uh, somewhat official, that um, we would transition. We would aim to transition all our infrastructure to uh, open source. And uh, the reason we made this pledge is because we realized um, that as an open access publisher, um, or that for open access to survive and truly be successful and be actually a sustainable model for a scholarly publishing, scholarly communications, um, every single aspect of the pipeline of the entire production or value chain or whatever you want to call it should be open. So that means that not only the end product itself should be open, but also everything on which that end product, that book or that article is produced and disseminated. Um, because if it's not, then this allows commercial actors to capitalize on, on that specific point in the, in, the, in the value production chain. And the moment that that is still possible, it is possible basically to monopolize or oligopolize part of the book production. So even if the book itself is open access, um, still someone will extract value from that production chain in a way that is counter to the entire idea of open access, which is maximum accessibility, not only in terms of readership, but also in terms of writership, in terms of publishership, in terms of editorship, in terms of translating, in terms of any way that you know we can interact with knowledge that is produced and somehow uh, uh, condensed onto a form that allows our eyes to access it. Um, namely, usually a book, or be that a website, or be that uh, 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 a, a performance, or any other form of communication between human beings that involves the eyes, and probably also the ears. I don't even see why we would privilege the, the visual organs here. So, um, so that's been our, let's say, uh, rationale behind this. And um, this was a desire, but we are very small uh, as a publishing house. We're not, I mean, I know that within open access publishing, we're probably slightly larger than maybe many other scholar-led open access publishing houses, but we still, you know, we're only like a handful of people working. Um, and um, it is thanks to a rather, uh, fortuitous coincidence of events that um, uh, we encountered Redon and uh, and started talking about you know how can we transition and uh, he was he was kind enough to help uh, to 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 provide us with uh, many different suggestions about how to find open access replacements for different parts of our of our infrastructure and if there is a desire I'm I'm willing to I'm very happy to show you some things that we have done uh, uh, since since November last year. Uh, um, but maybe first we should, uh, I should hand the microphone to Redon so that he can uh, say something. So hi from, from me as well. So my, a little bit of by, uh, my background, I am, um, uh, I'm a member, everything, my involvement in, in, in uh, open source infrastructure, uh, started when um, I was hanging a lot around at the local hackerspace here in Tirana. And uh, there was this uh, feeling that in the beginning there was this, uh, usually the hackerspaces are, are places where a lot of people have deep technical knowledge about uh, also very uh, complicated technical platforms hang around. But uh, the thing is that I don't consider myself a technical person. Uh, I just want to use tools that allow people to have more freedoms in adapting them or, or using them and not being um, be, being forced to use the technology in a certain way. So 
uh, this is how my fascination started with open source technologies in general. But uh, after after a bit, I started understanding that this doesn't make any, uh, this doesn't give, have, have any value as long as these tools are not used for, uh, by people, organizations, or institutions. So as as Vincent mentioned before, so like people we we met through different circumstances and uh, from coincidences from people knowing uh, common people in general and uh, the thing is that i was very surprised that uh, it was one of the rare cases where uh, someone that runs um, a, a, a project which is uh, uh, um, punctum books for example uh, is interested and knows very well uh, what uh, the importance of having also their infrastructure open source because we we have a a, a press like punctum books that is open access by design uh, but the digital infrastructure usually usually is used uh, the easiest thing the, that everybody knows and usually this uh, kind of infrastructure is proprietary is from big companies that scale and then they can give it for free in the beginning and after that bit they can lock you in and make make you use the 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 software in a way that they want you to use it so yeah i was as i mentioned i was very surprised uh although i i knew a little bit of background from vincent that he might have uh, i was surprised by the fact that punctu books wanted to do this Right. So we also are a very, very small team, and the majority of the um, uh, of the uh, infrastructure uh, in terms of software, uh, it's not as easy. It's not as hard to use as people think, because that's a lot of money put in by big, large companies to make us believe that. It sounds like a conspiracy theory right now, but it's believe me, it's not. So uh, these companies are the big tech companies like Amazon, um, which has a lot of servers all around the world, and all almost um, the majority of the websites that we access are hosted in an Amazon web server. Uh, Facebook, uh, Apple, and um, and of course Google, um, they are in the business of data mining and data managing. So they give a lot of the infrastructure to small companies or individuals for free or it seems so like in the beginning, right? So yeah, we started discussing about it. I thought it's, it's gonna be a, a harder task to do, uh, but believe me, it, it, it's not like this with the, all the organizations that we work with. Usually people tend to believe that, that this, as I mentioned before, they have this uh, perception that it's using open source software, it's, it's very bad. Uh, it, it's not easy or it's not user friendly, which used to be the case a decade ago, but now a lot of these tools have been improved. Actually, uh, this software we're using right now, it's called Big Blue Button, and it's an open source. And we just, uh, you can, I think you can see how easy it is to, to use it. And there are tons of other uh, platforms that we're probably we're going to mention later on which are also very easy to use but people like us or organizations or or, or small companies like ours uh, do not have the money or the the resources to promote and to talk to a lot of people to 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 to, to express to, to to share to show them how easy it is uh to do this uh, but this means that you need as an organization to change to have the will to change uh which it's not an easy task. Nobody likes to change a lot, usually by definition, I think. So yeah, that's the, the, the a little bit of background uh, uh, about the, the the context of our collaboration. I think we started talking about this the uh, in the last quarter of last year. Uh, it was November, right? I don't, Vincent. I don't remember exactly when we started. Yeah, I'm mute. I'm now muted. Um, in November, I think we started. Um, uh, uh, so Rodon is in Albania, and 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 I happen to have lived for a long time in Albania. I'm still there quite frequently, and um, and so as Rodon said, through coincidences, we met, um, and uh, we basically, I think, did the majority of the work in a day, <laughs> um, the entire switch. And and I would be happy to talk about a little bit about that. 
Um, if people have questions, in the meantime, if I'm going too fast or you have like specific questions about publishing and open source, then please uh, put them in the public chat and we can we can pick them up here and, and, and talk about them a little bit more. So um, maybe we should talk a little bit about the different elements of, of, of publishing uh, or the different elements that we consider elements in our publishing uh, production chain and, and how we are trying to find solutions for that. Um, so one of the things that, yeah, in a day, but that is really thanks to like Boris, who is not in this chat. And, and Boris and I spent the whole day basically uh, setting everything up in this marathon session. I don't think that this is a good uh, indication of how it usually goes, um, but it, it went pretty fast. <laughs> and Boris is in the chat um, for anyone uh, who wants to talk to Boris. So, hey, Boris. Um, so I think one core element, uh, at least for Punctum Books, is our communication structure. So uh, I am usually in the Netherlands or in Albania, uh, Eileen is in California, Dan is in Texas, our copy editors are all around the world, um, uh, our authors are obviously all around the world, and we use several things to communicate with them. Uh, one of them is email. Um, we, have an in we used to have an internal communication system, which uh, you may know as Slack. I think that this is a well-known commercial platform. For email, we all had our own Gmails or other proprietary emails. Um, and we use Skype uh, or something like that to communicate among ourselves uh, in terms of video messaging. So, right, so these are already three platforms and these are all three proprietary platforms or even more than three. Um, and for all of these three, there are uh, uh, open source solutions. And the thing about open source is that does, it's not only that um, you support software that uh, uh, is community built and community owned. What you also do is you support usually, uh, if it's well designed, this is also the most privacy oriented software. And for us, it was a very important uh, aspect because uh, as a lot of our authors are within the EU, we need to be GDPR compliant. The GDPR is a general data protection re uh, regulation, uh, which is very specific about um, what type of data you are allowed to store where. and us being the publishing house, we are still responsible for the data of our authors, even though these data may be hosted on some Amazon server or some other server that we have no control over and that we have no overview over. And so by switching also to these open source tools, it allows us more control over the data. And that has been a very important argument for us to make this move as well. So, but coming back to our communication systems, um, there are several open source uh, uh, privacy-oriented email solutions out there. One of, is, one of them is ProtonMail. Uh, uh, by the way, all the, all the things that I'm going to name, there are many other options usually, uh, but the things that we, are use, that we have used, I think it's in the shared notes. Uh, there is an overview, at least of the article that I wrote some time ago about the platforms that we use. So we use ProtonMail for email. Uh, it's uh, developed by CERN in Switzerland. Its code is open. Uh, it is fully encrypted from uh, ProtonMail to ProtonMail account. Um, instead of Slack, we use a platform that's called Mattermost. It is exactly like Slack, but it is, again, hosted on a server that uh, we are actually that Cloud68 controls for us, that only we have access to, that is very secure, that falls, you know, that allows us to tell our authors when you communicate with us through this system, we know where that data is stored, and we know that that data is stored, how it is stored, how long it is stored, and where it is stored. Uh, and again, this is very important in terms of being responsible with the data of third parties, in this case, mainly our authors, right, and their, and their intellectual work. Um, and then for internal communication, uh, we use something like Jitsi or Big Blue Button, right, as you can see here. And so there are many of these platforms that have been uh, uh, especially in our current uh, pandemic time uh, uh, scene arise. Uh, of course, everybody knows Zoom, but there are also uh, uh, platforms like this that are rapidly improving and basically offer the same type of service. Um, then, uh, obviously, when we make books, we use software to edit manuscripts and software to design manuscripts. Um, usually, uh, Authors use something like Word, um, 
to, to write their manuscript. I think, at least in the humanities, this seems to be the standard platform. Um, I myself have always used LibreOffice, uh, which is uh, a, a, uh, a office suite that is like Microsoft Office, but open source, and which allows you to edit also Word documents and Excel documents uh, in their native format, but on software that is completely open source, LibreOffice. At the same time, uh, and this is something that, that Punctum was already involved in since, I think, 2018, um, we are involved in developing Editoria. And Editoria is basically a tailor-made uh, uh, open source software suite uh, for the design uh, and typesetting of text that works fully in browser. And a little bit, I think, next week, uh, Redon and I will team up again to give a uh, demo of precisely that system, which is currently still in development, but is very promising in terms of first um, getting out of the Google Docs uh, and the Google, the entire Google uh, Office suite, which of course again is proprietary. You know, once you upload a document or uh, or numbers into the uh, Google Drive, it is automatically data mined. Uh, if you keep your household numbers uh, in your uh, Google Drive, Google knows what you have bought every month. It will know how much rent you have, have you spent. So like all of these things are probably not data that you would want to share, but they're automatically shared once you upload it into their cloud. Um, so again, this is taking back control of our own data. Um, so Editoria is something that we are really uh, keen about because it offers this type of shared collaborative space for book editing, which would, you know, once it's implemented, save us a lot of time going back and forth between authors with emails, which is always rather hellish. Um, and on the, on, let's say on the, on, the, on the output side of it, it will allow us, I think, in the future, once I re-educate myself into a CSS wizard, um, to, to replace uh, InDesign. And InDesign and the entire Adobe platform is obviously another of those proprietary platforms that is very expensive um, that I do not own because I have a subscription. And once I stop the subscription, this software is no longer on my computer. All the fonts are no longer on my computer. And all the design work that I've done over the last three years is no longer accessible. Um, this, I think, is an unacceptable situation. Uh, 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 and so Editoria allows us at least to imagine a future in which we're no longer beholden to this specific piece of software, which uh, for those of you who are in the publishing industry know it is omnipresent. There is nothing else and it is a complete monopoly and it's expensive and it is clunky, um, but everybody and every single designer in the world uses it either legally or illegally. Um, and, and we have to move away from this. Uh, we have to move away from this simply because it is not serving our interests. Um, so that is the editorial part. Then um, there is, as a third part, so we have communication, we have book production, and then the third part is basically our internal management, uh, archiving, um, our billing, uh, our file storage, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, most of you will probably use something like Dropbox of Google Drive um, to store files. Um, apart from the fact that these files are data mined um, uh, for profit in the end, and that you have no control over um, where those data are stored, how they are stored, um, you again, you have no idea. You are beholden to a company that owns your stuff. And once you stop your Dropbox uh, subscription, the data is basically gone. Also, when you decide to stop your Dropbox subscription, you have no idea how long they will keep your data. So, so this is so you're really giving things away that, in the end, is the intellectual property of your press and of your authors. And being an open access publisher, we uh, of course want open. We want intellectual property to be as least restrictive as possible. But it also means that we really care about ways in which these things can be monetized in a way that we don't think is correct. And and I think this is one of the cases in which this is a monetization that we do not that we do not support. Um, and so 
we decided to move all our files to Nextcloud, uh, which I'm also happy to show. It is like Dropbox. There is a little thing in my toolbar right here uh, that syncs it up with a server. Um, but instead of it being a Dropbox server that I don't know where that is, I know where this server where our Punctum Books data are. And I know the guy who is managing that server. And I know how well it is encrypted. And I know how many backups, backups there are. And I know how frequently they do the backup. And I know that whenever I need a backup, I can call someone that I trust that will give me that backup. And so there is a much, direct, much more direct connection um, for the same price. I mean, all of these things, in the end, if you have a professional license of Dropbox or professional license of InDesign or professional license of Microsoft Office, all these things cost exactly the same, if not, if not less, uh, at the risk of selling, sounding like a salesperson um, uh, uh, than the commercial, commercially available options. With the added bonus is that you control your data and you know where the things are. And being a rather obsessive compulsive person and a Virgo myself, I think that this is really important. So um, we have a next cloud in which we um, in which we uh, host all our all our data, basically like a Dropbox. Um, with the added bonus is that there are many different options and many different gradations of sharing and security that you have in, in Nextcloud that you don't have in Dropbox. And to give you an example about um, how um, I would say malicious something like Dropbox is, when we were doing the transfer, um, we noticed is that usually, I mean, what you think when you have your files on your computer and you have switched off the smart syncing option from Dropbox that you know that pushes most of the stuff in your cloud. If you have switched that off and you think that you have most of your files on your computer, we try to just move files from the Dropbox folders into the new Nextcloud folder and then sync it up. That didn't work. The files are simply not there. Nextcloud said, you have, you have absolutely given me nothing except for some type of weird pointer. We had to copy and paste files manually from Dropbox into Nextcloud, which means they had to be downloaded from Dropbox, copied, pasted, and then uploaded back into, into Nextcloud, which means that even though Dropbox tells you these files are in your hard drive, they are not, in fact. They are just very quickly downloaded. And so the fact that this happens without us being clearly notified, I'm sure it's somewhere in the terms and, terms and conditions, right? Without us being clearly notified that you know, what you think is on your computer is not there or not in the form that you think it is, I think this is enormously problematic. Anyhow, so that is about our file management system. Then when it comes to billing, you know, we have to send invoice, we have to send out invoices. It is nice if people can pay stuff online and, and uh, it's directly done through Stripe or through PayPal. Again, there is open source software that allows you to do that and be in control of your data, in this case, your financial data. Um, we have internal protocols. Uh, for example, you know, we would like to standardize our book editing procedure, for example. For this, we make a wiki. There is free software, uh, open source software, that is used for Wikipedia that you can just install on your own uh, server, and it allows you to, uh, it allows you to uh, create this internal documentation. Um, at some point, some of our authors said, well, we have audiobooks, right? So we would like to link audiobooks to 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 the to the written books that we that we publish, and so we reached out to Redonis like you know is there something that allows us to host audio like next not like SoundCloud, uh, but again something that's open source and where we know that the MP3s or WAV files that are sent to us by the authors are safely stored and accessible and shareable, but not on a proprietary platform. And again, this exists. So. It, it requires some time, and I would have difficulties finding these things myself, but they do exist, and we are very, very happy to share that knowledge because it, it's the same price, and your data is just safer. Um, so I think that's my pitch. Um, I, would very, I would be very happy to talk about how the transition itself works. Um, maybe, Redon, should I just continue talking? Is that okay? I, I just want to add something uh, in relate in the principle of of doing this. Uh, so the majority of the the uh, people participating in at Open Publishing Fest, I guess there are 
I, I take it for granted they are pro open access. Uh, which is very important and, and it's the same or for example librarians think that you know the physical infrastructure there for librarians is very very important as well uh, and it's this this physical infrastructure or whatever infrastructure you have to do your job uh, it's very important to be in in um, to be taken care of and unfortunately the majority of the organizations or entities, uh, oh, because they think it takes time, uh, they don't they don't take care of it. Uh, so about the transition, uh, I think what we did together was not a good case study because we did it in one uh, in a very like in one day. But uh, the 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 most sane thing to do, I would say, would be to to go one by one the majority of the people for example from my experience that they what they want to do in the beginning is uh, before the pandemic they wanted to have file saved somewhere so they had google 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 drive and or dropbox and they they choose next cloud so next cloud is the first thing that people usually ask uh, and the, and mainly after that it comes usually an alternative to to chat slack and both of those, there are there are people out there that can help you move all your data uh, from these platforms to to Nextcloud or or Mattermost or Rocket Chat, which are two of the alternatives that uh, you mentioned before. And it, it depending on the uh, the kind of data you have. For example, if you have many many files uh, on a Google Drive, it's going to take longer for someone that is you know it haven't uh, organized them well. Uh, to move them from Google Drive to Nextcloud. No, I mean, uh, I mean, actually, so, sorry, we don't. I mean, for us, like setting up, setting the things up was a day, but like moving the files from Dropbox to Nextcloud, it took me a week. It was it was a massive operation. It was like I don't know, three four hundred gigabytes of information that had to be uploaded. So that in itself takes a long time, but also just sorting it out. I mean, of course, you you do a big cleaning in the same time, right? But yeah, that that like the transfer itself takes a long time. Yeah, sorry. Yes, and uh, and and actually, it it takes a long time, and you need to do it gradually. I think it helps. From my experience, it helps people do some housekeeping, you know, uh, delete some files and uh, remove access from people that should not have access to some other files, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but this is the first thing people ask now with the with the pandemic. We are having many, many people asking for an alternative to Zoom, um, which uh, is there are two, two or three alternatives, very good ones. Uh, this one we are using is one of those, um, and the the other one, the other one is Jitsi uh, and other stuff. So, I think it, it's very important to to say that it's doing the transition. It's not that easy in terms of it because it needs some energy, but in the long term. Uh, I would say that you have someone or other people uh, do the the technical uh, work for you, like updating the software and maintaining it, and you just have to use it in the end of the day. It's the same with the other uh, well-known platforms as well. Uh, I, one thing you didn't mention uh, is that, uh, and this is related to also open access as well, is the fact that Almost all the, the open source platforms uh, by design have used all the open standards in terms of files and uh, uh, and uh, in terms of audio, text, or video files. They they promote more or by design they have they they tend to to use more open standards for their files than the other proprietary platforms uh, as well. So. This is what I wanted to emphasize uh, in this in this process. But the process of transferring, I would say, take one platform, take one platform, finish it, take another one. So drop uh, uh, from Dropbox to Nextcloud. I, and I after that, yeah. and I I think that that a lot of the speed is dependent on on buy-in from the people in your organization, right? Um, you all have to want to transition um, because if like half of your people are still using Dropbox and refuse to move to Nextcloud, then it doesn't work, right? So if still people are hanging out on WhatsApp or Slack while you've set up your Mattermost, so it is really also, I mean, frankly speaking about enforcing a new regime and creating new habits. And that is very often the most difficult thing. I mean, Punctum is very small. 
So, and we all agreed also on an ideological basis that this is something that we should do. So that habit creating part was easier. But I've also been in other organizations where that habit creating part is much more difficult. And it just takes a long time to extract people from their habits because they really like WhatsApp and they don't want to go to Signal or they really like Slack and they don't want to go to this Mattermost and it's weird and it's strange. But once you use it, uh, you know, it becomes the new habit. So there was a good question from Zoe uh, in, in the public chat and, and Boris already gave a little bit of a... Um, uh, of a uh, uh, answer to that. So, um, so at least when I can speak about punctum, um, uh, we try to, when we can, actively contribute to development processes. We are not specialists in all the software that we're using, but when it comes to Editoria, for example, um, this is an open source platform that we have been involved in actively in beta testing, in bug catching, in talking about developer, in talking with developers about how you know how to improve it, and we're te we tested several beta versions, um, and so we put in a lot of labor um, to help that piece of software get better because this is something that we understand well, which is publishing, uh, and it's something that we need, uh, which is open source publishing software. Um, when it comes to other uh, open source platforms that we use, we are, of course, much less knowledgeable about development processes. So, um, of course, us uh, working with Redona, and, uh, and again, I don't want this to devolve in, in a PR thing, but like the choice, our choice of working with Redon and, and his company has also been that I know that they actively contribute to the development of the open source software that we are using. And so I know that the money that we pay them for it also goes back to the open source developers and open source communities that are uh, 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 surrounding these platforms, right? So the choice of company or the choice of, uh, and of course there are many different providers of this open source software, but most of the people that do provide open source platforms are themselves active contributors. So if you, if you pay them for their help and assistance, then you are indirectly contributing to the further development of these open source systems. Um, so you can actively contribute yourself, um, which you know we, we try with some of the things that we use, um, and with others, uh, our our contribution is more indirect. Um, uh, there are two questions: uh, one from Zoe and the other one from Fred. So Zoe asks. Uh, so uh, th they are interconnected. So Fred asks if there are any people. Uh, so he wants to self-host uh, Nextcloud, and if there are any companies doing that. And Zoe also asked if there is a how about comp financial compensation for this this thing. This this also you answered this, but I want I also wanted to to say. My uh, my take on it. So the this is uh, this is very these things are very interconnected. So usually people that have uh, uh, so Fred, you can go uh, on a list that I think my friend Boris is going to share now is a link of ethical hosters out there, uh, which you can choose and pay them in order to host these uh, platforms for you, and uh, they have some things in common. Uh, and one of these, they take privacy, your privacy very seriously. They take other elements as well. For example, they really want to have servers that are they use renewable energy. So you can choose there. And usually these people, uh, because we know them, the majority of these people that have small companies, they contribute back in, in one way or the other. So some of them contribute in translations. Some of them... Um, um, have comport. Some of them are collectives. Give uh, free a lot of their uh, of of uh, what they are what they are getting in terms of financial back to the community. Um, I, almost all the people I know they give back on also reporting bags or they they, are, they have technical knowledge so they fix these bags as well. Uh, for uh, us, for example, we are very close to the next cloud. Uh, community and other people that that are running it as well. Uh, so there is so people like you, like Punctum Books or like uh, um, librarians. They 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 usually uh, go to to entities like like uh, ours that are considered ethical, and usually these entities 
uh, or group, a small group of people, they go back to the community and improve the software as well. So I can only count the number of bugs that there have been reported from people I know recently, which will uh, uh, improve the software in the end of the day. So the whole ecosystem, I think it's amazing. It's very bad that we, we don't talk a lot about how things work. And it's the first time, I think, the last five years that I've seen that it's not only about a group of people that contribute to the Linux. Now, uh, 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 small organizations like Punctum Books are using for real a lot of the things that are being produced in terms of the open source uh, open source software, and it's also it, it's also it's not only financial. It's our these are human relations as well. Uh, and collaborations, which I think is the the best thing you could you could do, and uh, the majority of these entities are small companies which care more about what uh, uh, of you thinking of that as as ethical hosters than anything else before financial gains as well. I can also share you an example that we had with some very good friends from another entity uh, uh before so it was uh, two weeks ago so there was uh, one of the companies wanted to to move um their digital infrastructure to our group uh and we we really want to make sure that everybody in, in in there is we spend a lot of time talking with all, everyone involved and make sure that no one is you know taking business out of anybody else so you see that there are so yeah uh, libre if you go to libre librehot.st you can see a list of this uh, libre hosters that it can help you uh, transition from proprietary to open source software as well and these people really really it's a real community um that put up front the ethical side other than the financial gains in it so another question about yes yes sorry. no no, no I, I sorry i think and that is also really what what binds open access to open source right it's an ethical commitment uh it, for me it is the most logical and the most natural thing in the world that that what is open source should be produced on open infrastructure this should be an absolute no-brainer um, sorry, you said there was another question? Yeah, from Fred. Uh, I'm going to answer that a, a little bit later, but I wanted to say that I'm, um, I'm a bit disappointed from, uh, from a lot of uh, mainly big organizations and uh, that they promote open access a lot. But when, the, when it comes to what they use internally in their kind of infrastructure, you can see horrible things happening. So Slack is everywhere. Uh, Dropbox is everywhere. Um, and these are organizations that put a lot. And the, the mentality is there for me is very wrong. They say, uh, well, I'm, pu I'm, pub uh, I'm publishing, I'm doing this in terms of open access, uh, making sure people have open access, but you cannot fight all the good fights. So I'm just fighting for this and the digital open uh, uh, digital infrastructure there can, can wait. I can, I can mention a few big organizations with big pockets. They do not do this. Uh, which is a very sad story because these organizations lead the way for smaller uh, organizations and companies uh, like Punctum Books to to make it easier because it's easier to follow once the you know big players are doing this as well. So I've, I'm I'm a big very uh, highly critical, but I think uh, we should start from smaller entities that they trust you uh, and vice versa in order to do this migration. So I, all the lists that Bo mentioned, the LibreHost website, all of the people who are gonna help you uh, also do the migration for sure. And also there, are, uh, if you just, if, if you make sure, for example, that you cannot afford in one way or the other, I'm pretty sure that everybody tries to, to and a middle ground to support as as long as open access or open tech or any other thing related to that. I think people will make uh, try their best. They go the long mile to help you um, transition because it's not easy. It takes patience, but it's you do it done. All the job is done. I, I have I have no I have nothing to add to that, Redon. Maybe if there are any more questions, um, we would be happy to. Uh, yes. Um, all right. Uh, well, Zoe, 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 thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Zoe.
Um, so yeah, Zoe, if you go to the to the Punctum Books, if you have any questions, website, you can also uh, have the chat there. There should be the link to the chat. So I just want to add all the share notes are there. Um, and I there is a community support program for uh, uh, one a lot of the people that want to join that can can uh, you know try out this how it works. Uh, you can join the chat of Punctum Books or the chat of the Open Publishing Fest to ask any questions. I think a lot of people that are organizing it are hanging out there. Yep. Uh, I, I think I Fred and Ellie yeah, are great. Right, okay. Uh, um, so I know that a lot of the scholarly presses highly value collaboration with each other. Do you find Punctum's decision decision to transition to open source software impedes your ability to collaborate with other presses? Um, no. Um, like the collaboration, um, at least between the open access presses in Scholar-led is not yet at the point that we are sharing infrastructure. Um, however, we are having, uh, so Scholar-led for those who don't know, um, uh, uh, Scholar-led is an organization currently consisting of six uh, uh, open access presses that are Scholar-led. That doesn't mean necessarily academ acad academy-led or university-based, but it means that we're that all the presses are led by scholars, um, and we're all fully open access. And we are now in the process of incorporating together as an or as association, also with the idea that we would like to sh excuse me, we would like to share uh, infrastructure. There is still a lot of debate going on on what that infrastructure should be and how that should be shared. Um, but many of us are already switching to Mattermost. Um, we are working on several projects together in which Nextcloud is used um, as a as the uh, as the uh, as the file hosting service. Uh, some of us are experimenting with Editoria. So it's like it's it's a bit of a patchwork. Um, does it impede collaboration? Um, I, I don't think so because, like in the end, uh, as Verdun already indicated all of these uh, systems use open standards. And so they're by definition compatible. So whatever I write uh, uh, in LibreOffice can be read by anyone on any other computer. Um, whatever file is produced in the end by Editoria as a PDF or an EPUB, which can be opened anywhere. So like um, in that sense, uh, I, I don't think it impedes collaboration, or at least I have not experienced it as, as being an impediment. Um, not more of an impediment, by the way, then, you know, using InDesign and then somebody not having the latest version of InDesign Cloud or whatever it is. Uh, and I'm sorry, I cannot open this InDesign file. Do you, can, you, can, can you make it an InDesign transfer file or an InDesign inter-exchange file and then embed the fonts? So I can, oh, but wait, I don't have the fonts because, like, I don't have that package. So can you send me the fonts illegally or do you, can I replace them with other fonts, right? So... Uh, I, I would say that with proprietary software, the compatibility issues and, uh, are much more problematic than with open software. Uh, I think there are many more impediments when you use proprietary software than when you use uh, uh, open software. So that, that would be my, sorry, very long binding answer. Um, uh, I, I wanted to add something there. So the some of the software that are, were mentioned that also are, are on the share notes, they use a concept called federation, which means that if I have Nextcloud um, on my server and uh, Vincent has his own Nextcloud on another server, these two things uh, can uh, be connected very easily together. Uh, and you can have one file getting access in, from more and more um, uh, next cloud instances, we call them. So, which means that the compiler, if a lot of people use more open source software that respect the standards by design, it's going to be easier for everybody. And I think uh, it's very, it should be very, very important to understand that by design, proprietary software means that usually uh, 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 standards are not enforced. They want to enforce their own standards, which is a problem in the long term. It's, it might be easy in the uh, in the beginning, of yes. course. Yeah, I, I think that actually that is a very important point, right? Because like when we are talking about digital publishing in general, one of the main discussion points is always long-term archiving, right? Personally, I think long-term archiving 
is this. It is the best long-term archive you can imagine for information that needs to be uh, consumed by the human eye. But, you know, for those who insist that things that are digital need to be digitally archived, um, open standards are obviously the thing that are going to survive. No one is able to open a word perfect document today. I remember like when, I mean, everybody has his stories, right? Like there was this key, key, key writer program that I used as a kid um, on, running under MS-DOS. Um, I, I cannot open my Kai writer files that I, that I made when I was seven with like, you know, uh, that I that I made hand coded uh, glyphs uh, glyphs for in a in a in, in, in a in a you know primitive font editor. Like these things do not survive because they're proprietary. Any proprietary file system, file storage system, data storage systems is not going to last. It's going to last even less than the open file systems that will be on the hard drives that will be illegible within the next five years. So, but that's a hardware issue, then at least on the software side, uh, uh, the data is should technically still be accessible. So also when it comes to digital preservation, open source is the only way. Like there should be no discussion whatsoever within the archiving or, or, or publishing world about the necessity to use, to use open source software and open standards for, in order to ensure the digital preservation of whatever we create today, whatever it's worth may be for the future, which is probably negligible. Anyhow, um, uh, 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 um, yeah, sorry to, to add that on. Uh, where, where is the, uh, if someone can help me, but Boris, can you tell me where is the chat for the Open Publishing Fest? So I think there, there are a lot of questions and if people want to, um, if we have questions after, after the, okay, thanks. So if you have any questions that we didn't answer today, uh, you can answer there as well. Uh, I yeah, think so, we can so wait also for... I think Boris yes. also uh, dropped a little bit above like the Pantom Books chat, which is an open yes. chat. So you can just uh, create a login and ask us anything about, uh, you know, if you have more publishing oriented questions, we are very happy to, to uh, discuss with anyone uh, later. Uh, uh, yes. outside, John, John, you know. John, mentions, John mentions the preservation argument is very ah. strong. In the last three decades of book production is locked up yep. in an incompatible post-Adobe file format. So absolutely. And absolutely. yet, and yet everybody uses it. I mean, if, if, if preservation is such a big deal that I always hear it is, again, I am not very much wedded to it. Clay tablets have survived. Your PDF will disappear you know, like that, you know, it will be irrelevant in, in, in human history, PDFs. Anyhow, <laughs> if, if this is a preservation is such a thing, why on earth is Editoria not like a million dollar funded operation to save the knowledge of the human race? Like why on earth are we, are we, are we still using InDesign? It's a mystery to me. And it's, and I think because like a lot of these discussions are, are in the end, disingenuous there they do not actually look at the infrastructure that we use but simply talk about you know a, a little band-aid you know we need we need a you know we need a bigger archive or we need a bigger hard drive or something like that without thinking about what software is running on that hard drive how is that hard drive built with what components is that hard drive built what labor by the way is going into the creation of that hard drive is that actually source of materials that we think will be sourceable in the future under humane circumstances, which they are not. So like all of this, like for me in the end, it is not, it doesn't stop at, it doesn't stop at open source and open infrastructure. I mean, it is, it is about the entire, uh, 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 what Benjamin Breton called our stack, which, which in the end goes down to the way that we source the resources that are used in the chips that are used in the hard drives. I mean, it goes all the way down because like by, by making our book production chain open, that, that in the end is only like a drop in the bucket. It is about, it's about opening up that entire stack from cobalt mining up to cloud services. So at least that is the way that I think about it. And then, you know, there's just, oh, otherwise and, and this- again, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and again, I, I want to, because I'm also frustrated with this. So I, I yes, said in the yes, beginning, I will, so not, frustrated. I will not name anyone, but it usually is, for example, you have all these 
uh, or big organizations they they put a lot of money in you know giving open access to stuff and when get, they use proprietary software because i don't know why because probably the the company that are using this proprietary software it's in the same city where they are and they lobby and it's very easy for them i don't know why this happens but it's it's a mystery also to me why these things are are do, do not happen but uh, i think there is a there is uh, this had me so starting working with you made me uh, understand that it's easier to you know to 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 convince all organizations than to have you know to be, to go to a big one and say you are wrong because usually these organizations have many many people in the decision making process and um, you know when you have a lot of people it, the majority of them especially in the middle management they tend to and not to be bold on in doing changes they want to preserve the the things as they are so for me it's it, we i've been delighted collaborating and working and and helping smaller organizations than these bigger bigger ones so maybe i think the question might be it's better to have 200 or 2000 punctum books than one big i don't know wikimedia Absolutely. foundation i mean this is right. the entire idea behind scholar led it is scaling small like we are not we are in the end. We're actually not against like big publishing co corporations. We just believe that a wide variety of different publishers with different ways of operating and different ways of thinking about books, diversity in the publishing landscape, that is the key. Like the death is going to be the death of the book is going to be not you know the PDF, but the death of the book is going to be an oligopoly of knowledge providing Google esque data mining moguls that lock in the entire scientific research production chain and basically smother it to death in proprietary platforms and that is where we're going i mean recently the the open sign the big open science deal by elsevier that is exactly what is that it is basically locking in the entire research chain into proprietary environments in the hope that value extraction that you're losing at the end of the publication because it's open access that you will recuperate at the beginning when somebody is entering data in an excel sheet and this is i think is utterly unethical and should be should be banned like I, anyhow like this 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 is just it is very upsetting and, <laughs> and I, I agree uh, so dave says uh, from the chat seems that the presses that go this way deserve more prestige i think yeah. <laughs> this organization, this the, what we're doing now, Open Publishing Fest, uh, and other similar stuff, need self-organizing. I might be the the right solution. I think it has worked in other areas. Why not in this one? And also, Fred mentioned is because of the money flow. Uh, it's easier to pay companies a lot of money than developers little money. You want to extra uh, to. That's true. I agree. And that is. So I've been I've been involved in in open source communities for uh, since 2012 actively, and I I couldn't agree more. So these big organizations they don't, but I, I hope I'm wrong. But they don't. Uh, um, they just want to go to one big entity and give it there. The lawyers are happy because somebody takes responsibility for it, and that's it. Uh, and that's why I should work more into these uh, small and presses. Uh, and any other organizations that, that are that work in this area. All right, I I think people are slowly leaving. It's it's eight o'clock. Are there any final questions? Again, we we'll, we both Redon and I are available on various platforms on Twitter or wherever you want. You know, Twitter again. Ex right, it's like really why are we still on Twitter? Yet there we are. How how do we extract ourselves from this platform? I I have not. I mean. I've been able to 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 get out of Facebook, but like anyhow. Um... Uh, so the recording is going to be available later. Uh, we will going to be around uh, <laughs> at the chat, as uh, I'm saying it again. Uh, but g please, if you guys want, if one of you wants to 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 migrate, please go to the list that uh, was mentioned before, librehot.st. Unfortunately, there it's not very friendly, but you have it on the chat, uh, URL friendly, you have it on the chat. And there, please ask one of these entities uh, of group of people how they can help you 
the, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can get a demo or, or in one of all these instances that mentioned before by are listed on the shared notes or mentioned by Vincent. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in, a, in, a, in a time in which migration is becoming more and more possible, more and more difficult physically, we have to migrate digitally. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. Um, this will be up somewhere recorded, I think, very soon. And thank you for attending. And I hope you have a great fest the rest of the week. Bye.